coming back. Uh, but yet there are still quite a few seats scattered throughout the audience. So if you want to come forward and let these nice people be happy to let you in. Anyway, feel free to come on in. We're going to start in a few minutes. Thank you. When I was eight years old. 
Um, I'm presenting today with two of my esteemed peers, Saul Aguilar and Matt Anderson. And they will be presenting about memory and design, whereas I'm presenting about what we call hardware. So I'd like to begin with a simple question. And everyone who is this is right. I'll work it. Um, you see two images up here on the screen. My question to you is, are they in fact the same? <laughs> I know they look a lot alike. I can see where you get confused. I mean, um, if you think about one of them, it requires lots of peripherals and it's nice into a suitcase. And the other one is, of course, a laptop. <laughs> My assessment of this is that they are, in fact, the same. Now, why? If we think about it with a computer, all computers have a source of input. Usually it's a keyboard, sometimes with a mouse. If you're using a touch screen device, it's actually touching on the screen itself. But there needs to be some way to get what you want into the computer. With human, we have our senses. You know, we have five senses. We have touch, smell, hearing, seeing, tasting. And to the best of my knowledge, there are computers that have like a taste input. Um, but most of them have screens, which we perceive through our eyes. That is our primary mode of input for a human being. And then, of course, a computer takes that information that we input into it and processes it. It usually stores it on a hard drive, saves it in its memory, and then it does something. With a human, we're actually kind of similar. Um, we have a brain. So our input goes into our brain, where it's saved as memory, at a short or long term. And then we do something with it. We process it. And lastly, there's output. And with a computer, it's usually a screen, although you could also just re-save something to memory, send it to a printer. But 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm going to bet, it's with a screen is where I'm. And here's where things are a little dark. Because with humans, we don't have screens. It's not like we're teletubbies with TVs like right in the middle of our chest. No, we're, we're something a little bit different. What we want for an output is usually an action. For example, a mouse click. So that mouse click, you can be at work, and uh, if you're building medical software, it could be to a patient to order some meds. Or if you're at home, you might be ordering something from Amazon so that you can finally get that last beanie baby that you've been looking for for years. Um, so, so in our process, we, we've now established that humans and computers are in fact similar on a number of major levels. We have input, process, and output. I know that with a computer, I can manipulate the input. I can manipulate the process. And that in turn will change what is my output. So if I wanted to have it set out how I know what that result is, I can change something about what's going to the keyboard or the mouse or something about how it's actually processed, and I get the output that I want. So if this holds true, then for a human, I should be able to do the same thing. I should be able to change something about how my seems. I should be able to change something about how the brain processes information so that I can achieve an action. This is my mother. And I told her the title of this conference last week, and uh, she was a little alarmed. So later on that night, uh, I decided to ask her, because she's, she's a lay person. She's not in IT. She's not like the rest of us. She's not an engineer. She's never coded. She's not a software architect. Um, so I asked her, uh, yes. It's not an evil thing, it's just a particular method. 
Um, so, taking a look at our human, how will we have the input? What is our input? The input is the output. So we do know that looking at the physiology of the eye, the eye does not move in a continuous, smooth path. Even though we think it does, that's because the brain is compensating for the rapid movements in our eyes. You probably didn't know this, but the fastest moving part of your body on the exterior is in fact the eye. It's constantly jumping back and forth. And when we read a computer screen, it's actually doing the zigzag pattern. Constant back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. If you're reading a long list of text, it actually looks like an F. And my fellow presenter, Matt Anderson, will be talking more about this saccadic movement later on in his presentation. But that back and forth argument produces some really interesting results. Uh, okay, we have black squares. And as your eye moves around these black squares, are you starting to see like little dots when you come on? And that's because your eye is moving back and forth and gets stuck on the edges of all, these, of all these squares. Here is an image with highly saturated opposing colors. So that the retina groups inside your eye, the center of that group, sees a color. Meanwhile, the outside of that retina group is trying to move away from it. So it creates artificial motion. This works on a computer screen at home. Does this actually look like it's moving? Um, so, what did we learn from this? How can we use this to help us hack a human? Well, really, we, want, we found out that we never want to use this at all. Um, in fact, they are, they are negative responses. We found out that things that happen in the eyeball, we really don't want to play with. And, and in fact, we want to avoid them. So we want to, in fact, use white space and use color harmonies that work not the things that are bad, unless we want our users to be really mad. <laughs> the processor, on the other hand, there's, there's some potential. So this part of the brain that's highlighted in pink is called the amygdala. And the eyes connect to the optic nerve, and the optic nerve goes right in and touches the amygdala. Now you, you've heard people say that there's an animal inside. This is your old reptile brain. It's the one, it's the thing that has all of your core emotions. When you feel deep gut fear, it comes from the amygdala. And the amygdala, in my mind, is just like Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know who Gilbert Gottfried is? Yeah. He's, he's, a, we, he's best known for being the voice of the Aflac duck, right? He's like, Aflac! Aflac! Right? So the amygdala is constantly Assessing things. It's making little judgments like a little critic, and it's just doing this constantly every single waking moment of your life. So it's saying things like, This bad, this is good, I hate this, all this is taking too long, this is delightful, I want more! <laughs> and it's doing all the yoga doctor voice, because that's how I am. <laughs> <laughs> so the amygdala works really, really fast. Uh, when you see something, it is processed by the amygdala in less than 50 milliseconds. I mean, that is, that is so little amount of time, you don't even have the ability to perceive that little amount of time. So it's constantly doing that, and that's only a problem because the amygdala talks to his good buddy and sits right next to him, higher brain function. So higher brain function is all like, I like to do math, I like to talk and write, do language, think logically, talk about emotions, Rational things and logic. The amygdala, not so much. Just build a box. So, take for example the New York Times. This is what it looks like. This is uh, the you know, newspaper record from the United States, the great media, all the news that's fit print. Uh, it's won more Pulitzer Prizes than any other newspaper. It is possibly the most credible newspaper in the world. It has this look, which most of you will identify, and it has chosen this look painstakingly. Because, for example, if it looked like this, <laughs> you have a different reaction to it. It's the same exact content, same headlines, same stories. 
But it doesn't present itself like this. It presents itself a different way. And the reason for that is the amygdala. Because he sits there and says, oh, this is horrible. And that, in turn, colors all of the decision and emotion and evaluation that the higher brain functions are doing. So if you're sitting there reading that full surprise when the story on that horrible screen, you're not going to think it's as good as it probably is. So that's why we want to do something called prior, which is to always take into account the fact that there's a make making small, small judgments all the time. So if we're doing Metasol, which needs to be highly credible, that always needs to give us a feeling of authority, like this information is completely accurate. It is beyond question. We don't want it to look like geocities. We want it to convey authority. So priming is, is what we need to do in those kinds of situations. Moving past the amygdala, we have other parts of the lower brain. And this lower brain is where we make subconscious decisions. So do you remember when I said, repeat after me, and y'all did that after the other thing? And I asked, why did we do that? Um, the short answer is, because the screen told you. I don't know. I'm not a smart aleck. Thanks for telling me that. Um, a better question about is why we did the screen. And the answer to that is something called a field of study, it's a field of study called heuristics. And heuristics is simply put psychology plus an action. That, 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 that's the easiest way to put it. Um, it's how we approach all problems that are thrown at us. And I'm looking, I was looking during my research for an exhaustive list of how many known heuristics there are, and there doesn't seem to be one, but there are 24 common ones. And these are them. And back when I thought that this was going to be a 90 minute long uh, <laughs> session, I was going to go through each of these. But instead, I'm just going to talk about the two that made us do the repeat after me. And that would be authority and availability. People tend to follow the instructions that are shown on the screen. And this is a good thing, because without that civilization, you collapse. I mean, think about it. We, we are in front of screens all the time. There, there's usually at least one screen at home, possibly several. You have an iPad with a TV and a desktop a computer down in your office. Um, they're in your cars. Most of the dashboards have one screen in gas screens. They're in restaurants, they're in bars, they're in airports. And my guess is that most of you have at least one in your pocket right now. We are literally surrounding ourselves with screens. And if Google Glass gets their way, we'll all be wearing the screens separating us from reality 24 seconds. So, with authority, we want to use clear instructions. And with those clear instructions, people will follow them. And in this case, we said, please repeat after me. And he did. There was no threat. The other one is the availability heuristic. And this one is important. Why it is important? to keep things consistent within computer applications. Um, if you're in one situation and things behave one way, you expect it to behave that way a second time and elsewhere. So if there's an icon on one screen and you click it, it gives you a pop-up, and then you're on a screen of, you know, a little while later, and you see that same icon and you click it, and instead it closes down the form that you just were in, it's the wrong page, that breaks the availability of risk. You've probably seen other situations where people were shouting things from the stage and people respond. So, this made it safe for you, and uh, that's the availability of the risk. So, to move on and keep things flowing, we're now going to talk about the higher brain functions with my peers, Matt and Saul. Um, Saul will be talking about, remember, he's, he's really one of the best UX researchers I've ever met. And He's probably forgotten more about the subject of memory than I will ever know. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Saul Aguilar.